Well, welcome everybody to our fourth EBNEO Journal Club. And today we're gonna to be talking about network mode analysis. This has been a very exciting area and I'm happy to welcome back Shovik to, to really give us some insight. He's led some of the network mode analyses on, on um, treatment of a PDA. And so you know, in the last few months, we've highlighted a number of different network mode analysis. There's been one on the use of different types of probiotic supplementation, the effect on NEC, about cord management strategies, and most recently about postnatal steroid use for the prevention of BPD. And so, Shulik, I wonder, you know, before we get into the details of some of these, I wonder if you could tell us kind of what is a network meta-analysis and how does it differ from a conventional meta-analysis? Thanks, Ravi. So in a conventional meta-analysis, we synthesize evidence comparing two treatment options, which works great when you only have two treatment options. But that is no more helpful when you have multiple options such as different strains of probiotics, different cord clamping strategies, and the most recently published different strategies for postnatal corticosteroids. Now, what do you do when you have all of these three options that have not been compared simultaneously in the same trial setting? But as a clinician, you have all the options and you have to make a decision. So that's where NMAs are helpful because it helps us to estimate the, re the relative effect of each treatment option through direct and indirect comparisons. So for example, if a trial, you had one trial that compared a treatment A versus treatment B, and another trial that compared treatment A versus treatment C, a network meta-analysis would allow you to then kind of do a comparison between B and C. Is that, is that kind of the, the way these work? Absolutely. So say you have a bunch of A versus B trials and a bunch of B versus C trials, but no A versus C trials, then in an NMA, by using direct and indirect comparisons, you can actually combine the three and have relative effect estimates for both A, B, and C. Okay. Now, are these able to be combined? Uh, what considerations do you think of as you're looking at these in terms of should these be combined? Are they, are they comparable? So we need to understand that an NMA is not a randomized trial. It is merely an observational study of already published trials. So an NMA is prone to the same risks of bias that's there with any other observation study. And the most important of them is selection bias. So for the results of an NMA to be trustworthy, the reader needs to be convinced that the characteristics of the participants in all the included trials were such that they could have been enrolled in the same randomized trial. And this is called transitivity in NMA parlance. So before you read the results for any NMA, first make sure that the transitivity criterion is met. So you want, you want to take a pause before you get into the results to actually make sure that that's met, right? Yeah. So let, let's go into this network meta-analysis just, just published very recently, looking at different personal corticosteroid regimens for the prevention of BPD. And as, as many of our viewers know, there's different types of steroids, different routes of administration, different doses, and different timing. And as clinicians, we, we might want to know which, which of these different options I choose. And so the, this study looked at this, and, and here's a picture of the um, network plot. So can you walk us through kind of this network plot and, and how, how you would view this as it relates to kind of these different steroid treatment options? So a network plot essentially gives you an overview of all the treatment options that were included in the analysis. So as you can see in this plot, each circle, also called the node, uh, represents a treatment option. The size of the node is proportional to the number of infants randomized to that treatment option overall. A straight line connecting two nodes denotes that a head-to-head -head trial has been conducted between the two treatment options. And the thickness of the line is proportional to the number of head-to-head -head trials that were conducted between the two uh, treatment options. So Shabak, one of the things that's you know, relatively new to network meta-analysis that might not be apparent in conventional analysis is the use of SUCA ranking. So can you walk us through kind of what SUCA rankings are and how you interpret them? Yeah, so when an enemy is done right, what it will tell you is that what are the chances that a treatment is the best or ranks first? Similarly, what are the chances it ranks second, third, and so on? And it does that for every treatment option. So you can plot the cumulative probability of a treatment uh, being ranked in each position. And SUCRA, or the surface under the cumulative ranking, is this final area under the graph for such probabilities. 
So if a uh, treatment is clearly better than the rest, it will have a very high chance, almost 100% of ranking first. And therefore its sucra value will be closer to 100% or one. Similarly, if a treatment is clearly worse compared to others, it will have very little chance of ranking higher. So its sucra value will be closer to zero. Thank you, Shabak. So when you're looking at sucra values, how do you, in, in looking now at the plot uh, of this study, how do you interpret um, the results for, for the network analysis on, on postnatal corticosteroid regimens? So if you look at this graph, um, the, the curve for the moderately early initiated medium dose dexamethasone or the pink curve clearly has uh, the highest or the largest area under, under the curve compared to the others. And therefore its sucra value is closest to 100%, which suggests that it might be the best treatment option. Whereas if you look at the gray curve or the curve for the placebo, it clearly has the least area under the curve of all these curves. So therefore it is probably the least effective option for this particular outcome. But now it's also important to mention here that a single sucra value could be misleading if there's a lot of imprecision in the final estimates for a particular outcome. Uh, it is almost similar to making a judgment based on a point estimate of the relative risks without taking into account the 95% confidence intervals. So readers should keep that in mind when making a choice and carefully look at the forest plots with uh, the, the relative risks and the 95% credible intervals in case of a Bayesian analysis because they may find that even if the sucra says one is better than the other, practically there might be no difference whatsoever between um, the, the highly ranked treatment options. Thanks, Shavik, and, and you make some important points. And I, and I would add to that, you know, thinking about the certainty of evidence, and we've talked about grade, and you know, take a look at episode number two. We, Shavik does a nice job of, of discussing grade and, and also how imprecision might downgrade the certainty of evidence. And I imagine we're gonna see a lot more network analysis in the future. I, I think you did, and I wanna bring the viewers to this tweet you put up in response to this, when we posted this EBNU alert about this issue of, of um, safety. And, and I do think, you know, super rankings are relevant to the outcome that's being ranked here, BPD, but also to consider rankings of other important outcomes, such as the risk of neurodevelopmental impairment or cerebral palsy, which, which might have a very different profile of rankings than BPD, and, and then both need to be considered together. Um, so, Shobek, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for our viewers watching, and, and we look forward to seeing you next time uh, for EB Neo Journal Club. Thank mm -hmm. you.